Honest, real, and supportive. You are listening to The Brave Files, real stories from people living courageously. You can listen to the show anywhere you enjoy podcasts, and we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on Apple Podcasts. It really does make a difference, and we appreciate it. Now here's your host, Heather Vickery. Hey there, listeners. I hope you're having a wonderful Thursday. This is Heather Vickery. I'm the host of the Brave Files podcast. You probably already know that. I'm so glad to have you here with us today. So I have a question for all of you listening. Did you know that overall positive emotions can add up to seven years on your life? Did you also know that grateful people tend to have less stress-related illnesses, healthier body compositions, and they experience lower blood pressure. These are just some of the reasons I created my very own gratitude journal, Shift Your Focus. It's now available on Amazon. This beautiful gratitude journal will walk you through my personal journey towards gratitude, teach you the science behind gratitude, as well as give you the tools necessary to connect with gratitude in creative and unexpected ways. A regular gratitude practice helps us feel more connected both to ourselves and to one another. It paves the way towards greater happiness, success, and it provides motivation that we need to choose bravely. If you don't already have a copy, grab one now, and while you're at it, get one for someone that you care about so that you can both experience the joy of gratitude. The book is available on Amazon right now. Speaking of being grateful, I am extremely grateful for today's guest. Elena Boss and I have known each other for years. And when I found out about a new project she was working on, I was eager to share it with all of you. Elena is a photographer here in Chicago, and she began a wonderful new initiative called the Face of Infertility Project. It was a personal means to process through and bring light to her own fertility issues. And it's her hope that creating such a project will help other women feel supported and unafraid to have conversations about their own fertility struggles. Elena, welcome to The Brave Files. Thanks so much for having me, Heather. I'm super stoked. Yeah, I've really been looking forward to this. I have been watching your journey with this project, and it's really going to be something special and beautiful. Let's start, though. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your own journey with infertility? Okay, Well, in 2013, when my husband and I were living overseas in Dublin, actually, I was first diagnosed with endometriosis and PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. And I had a lot of emotions that I dealt with when I received that diagnosis in terms of how I felt about my own body and what I felt like uh, was its failure to um, perform, I guess you could say, uh, for lack of a better word. So I was really lucky that I found an amazing doctor um, in Michigan, Dr. Lee, who um, took- Shout out to Dr. Lee. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. He's seriously the best. (laughs) Took really amazing care of me and was just very positive and- absolute in in the fact that he he thought he could he could help me so in march of 2014 i was able to have surgery and he cleaned up my insides <laughs> and was able to get all the endometriosis and i had multiple cysts on my ovaries as well uh, which was quite a feat because i did have endometriosis like on the outside of my uterus, on both of my ovaries, uh, on my bladder, bowel, appendix. Wow. Uh, it was all over, basically. Wow. And I happened to be one of the people who was fairly asymptomatic in terms of having a lot of pain and other issues. I just kind of had a hunch like that I knew that something was wrong. And he just was like, why did you even come in? And I just said, I don't know. I just, I just knew that something <laughs> wasn't right. Had you been trying to conceive and couldn't at this time, or was it really just female intuition? Yeah, it was really at this time, I wasn't trying to conceive yet because we had just moved overseas and we're going to be there for two years. And I had kind of had been a little bit symptomatic. Um, My periods got heavier and I had more cramps than usual, but it, it, it kind of came from 
me having a little bit of ambivalence, not really knowing exactly what I wanted, but also being over 30 and starting to get pressure from outside sources. <laughs> like you better figure this out, you know? Right, right. So I decided that it was time to go get things checked out and kind of just get a better handle on my fertility because I was over 30. And I knew that if I wanted to have kids, I was going to have to probably start thinking about it fairly soon. Um, once the Ireland trip, trip, I call it a trip, but once we were, <laughs> once we were, once a two year trip was over. I like that. I want to go on a two year trip, except I yeah. have to take all my kids with me. That would, yeah, that would be you. tough, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they would have fun. I'm sure. I am sure they would. They would love it. They have the travel bug just like their mama does. Um, so I happen to know that you do have a beautiful son. So how long was it from when you had this surgery until you started actively trying to conceive and then um, got your little guy? So I had the surgery, like I said, in March of 2014, and then my doctor wanted me on continuous birth control um, all the time. He never wanted me to like ovulate or have a period um, because just having my hormones not suppressed increases my, increased my chances of having all the endometriosis grow back okay, just because of the shift in the, in your hormones. So we lived overseas until 2015. So I was on birth control that, uh, that whole time. And then when I, I happened to move back to Chicago about six months before my husband did. And Within that time, I started going to acupuncture and taking a bunch of Chinese herbs. Okay. I'm all for alternative medicine options. Yeah. So <laughs> actually, I just always tell everyone that my acupuncturist got me pregnant. <laughs> Excellent. Um, context required. Yeah, context required. <laughs> she's a lovely lady. <laughs> um, and, you know, she's just has a lot of infertility patients. And I was just one of the lucky ones. And I got pregnant about six months after my husband moved home. Excellent. Okay. So you, t it sounds to me, um, I have been really lucky. I've never had infertility issues. In fact, yeah, I, I just started to think about getting pregnant and I did several times. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, it, but I do know several people who have had infertility issues. And it sounds like all things considered, things worked out more quickly for you than they do for some women. They, they really did. Um, and that was kind of a little bit of a block I initially had um, when I, I initially started and wanted to do like a face of endometriosis project. Okay. And I thought because the everybody looks different, right? So, yeah. and all the symptoms are very variable. So it was something that I was like, okay, I think that it would be really cool to do some sort of like a photo gallery of all different women with endometriosis. And then I went to a photography conference um, in September and it was all about becoming in, re-inspired by your work and mastering your craft and how that was manifested through doing personal projects and how personal projects were so important. And so it was, you know, a couple years later that I finally got to the place where I was like, you know, I'm like ready to talk about this. I'm not embarrassed anymore because I just felt sort of betrayed by my own body, really. Mm. And I just said, you know what, I'm ready to do this. And through some brainstorming with a couple of my photography colleagues, I was able to come up with, I, I want to include all women dealing with, you know, different kinds of infertility. So that is kind of where it came. And to make a long story short, <laughs> through Throughout that process, I did have doubt in my mind because I was like, well, I got pregnant, you know, without IVF or other medical measures. And I felt like, I am I really somebody who should be doing this project? Wow. Imposter syndrome strikes again. Yeah. So I was just like, you know what? Honestly, I'm just going to put it out there on social media, see if people are interested in doing it. 
participating in the project, see if women would be willing to share. And everybody's story is different. So just because mine ended a different way doesn't make it any less relevant. Right. And just because you didn't have to go the IVF route doesn't mean you didn't struggle with infertility. Right. Because I definitely had like my fair share of, uh, you know, months and years of of dealing with things that weren't easy, but I just was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm so lucky comparatively that it, am I really the person that should be doing this? But once I kind of got over that self-doubt, I was just like, you know what, it's a hard thing to talk about. And if I feel like it's something I can do, then if I'm going to help other women feel less alone, then let's just go with it. Absolutely. So tell us about the project. So the project, um, in November, I started I actually put out a call on social media and said, hey, I'm thinking about doing this photography project where I photograph and feature women who've dealt with infertility infertility in some way. And please reach out if you're interested in participating. You know, you have to be willing to be photographed and willing to share a little bit of your story. And I got a really overwhelming response. And that was when I just kind of realized that this is like way bigger than me. And maybe I'm just the vehicle to get this conversation started. Absolutely. I love that. All right. So you've gathered these women and they've shared their stories with you and you're taking beautiful photographs of them. What do you plan to do with all of these things once you have an entire collection? So what I was hoping to do and what we're actually planning to do now and we're in the the works to get started is to create um, a coffee table book uh, called Face of Infertility and it's going to feature the photos of the the women that I've photographed and a little snippet of their story and we really want to keep it positive and inspiring for women who are dealing with you know a tough a tough topic so we're going to share like little tips like I did this and it really helped me or this quote really inspired me or so it's going to be on the left side of the page I'm envisioning like written story and then on the right side a beautiful black and white photograph of that woman. Wonderful when do you hope to have the book complete and ready? So I'm hoping to have the book complete by the end of 2019. You can do it. But it might be quicker. (laughs) We'll see. Initially, you know, this totally started as like a small personal project that I was like, I'm just going to do this book like right away. But once the project started to pick up steam, I just was like, oh, my gosh, this project needs like its own Instagram account. and It needs its own website. And like so many people are starting to follow along now that. I just really started thinking, okay, if I, if I push this out too soon, then not enough people are going to see it and then it's not going to help as many women. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that it's such a beautiful concept. You know, we talk a lot on this show about all sorts of topics that have previously sort of been taboo for a better lack of a better word, Yes. Um, things that people are uncomfortable to admit or ashamed of or anything like that. And infertility is definitely one of those things. So the more you can mainstream it and understand that um, there's nothing wrong with you, there's nothing to be ashamed of, I think the more we can really change the way people feel about something. And, you know, when I was talking earlier about gratitude and mindset Those things really do have an impact. Um, You know, I hear all the time people who can't have children and then they decide to adopt children and then they get pregnant, right? Like there's something about changing your situation or changing your your mindset or your energy level that has a physical effect on on your body. So, Eleni, can you tell us about some of the women that are involved in this project with you? So... It was really important for me in the current uh, political climate to make sure that this was a culturally, racially, and economically diverse project. I wanted every woman who opens up this book to be able to thumb through the pages and say, I see someone in here that looks like me, and because of that, I feel less alone. I'm not the only one. So we do have a pretty diverse group of women women of color. There are some lesbian women who have 
had infertility issues that are part of the project. We have a couple women who have dealt with cancer, so they've had in, infertility struggles. So that was something that was really important to me, and I was really excited by the outcome of, of who had offered to, you know, put their heart on their sleeve and, sh- and share what had been kind of difficult for them to share before. I really love and appreciate that, uh, the fact that infertility doesn't just seek out one type of person or, you know, one race or one culture, one sexual orientation, you know, any of that. So thank you for making it so that everyone can see themselves in a project like this. I think that's just really beautiful. Yeah, thank you. It was just really important to me to make sure that as many different people as possible were included because like you said, uh, infertility has no, no boundaries. It doesn't have a, a phenotype or, you know, it affects everyone. Have you learned anything surprising through this process? Well, one thing that I've learned through talking with many of the women who have participated is that there can be an additional layer of stigma associated with infertility regarding different cultural backgrounds. Okay. So what, what cultural backgrounds specifically have you heard this about? Um, So I've worked with and photographed some women of Indian descent and actually a couple of women who've adopted their kids and you know, it, it's something that is, is really not talked about in Indian culture and not always like accepted, like, oh, we're, we're going to create our family by, by adoption. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, it is really interesting. Yeah, fascinating. I, you know, culture impacts our lives in so many ways and what we've been told all along is acceptable or unacceptable and rewiring yourself there. That's a really big challenge. It is. So I'm so lucky and proud of the women who uh, agreed to participate and, and are overcoming um, that every day. And they are really the, the women to thank for opening up um, and starting this conversation that needs to be had. Yeah. How brave of each of them. Elena, what's been the biggest struggle so far with this process? I'd say that the biggest struggle probably has been the fact that I really do want to include everyone and I'm still looking for more women of color to participate. My goal was to photograph 50 women and it is a fairly diverse group, but I wanted to have a few more women of color and different cultures included just to help make the the book more more rounded out and to include what I feel like is a little bit more of everybody. Okay. So if there are any women of color listening that are interested in participating, how should they reach out to you? They can email me at info at elenaboss.com or they can check out our website. It is faceofinfertility.alaina bos.com and send me a note through that. And that would be awesome. Yeah. If you have listeners that want to participate, send them my way. Sure. Do they need to be Chicago based? Um, If they're willing to travel to me, then no, they can be from anywhere. Okay. So ladies, if you're out there and you want to be involved in this project, reach out. We will link all of those um, ways to connect with Elena in the show notes. So I, That's your biggest struggle. What has been maybe the most rewarding aspect or perhaps the biggest surprise as you work on this project? I think that the the most rewarding aspect of the project has been to have all these women come into the studio who may or may not have been feeling great about themselves, be photographed and see their images and feel beautiful when they have seen them. We had a lot of really generous community partners who helped to sponsor the shoots. So I had makeup artists and hair dressers um, come in and do touch-ups for the women before they were photographed. I had 
some local businesses, like helped me put together a little gift bag. So it was really just all about making the women feel special and supported and cared about throughout this process. And that has meant the most to me. I love that. That sounds like a wonderful way to encourage and inspire and make people feel seen. Yes, for sure. Did it feel like you were doing something brave when you began this journey? Well, I think for me personally, I struggled a lot with just even getting the diagnosis of endometriosis and finding out that I might not be able to get pregnant or have children. And I felt a lot of shame around that. So it was something that I didn't talk about for at least a couple years. Yeah, I had no idea that that's something that you had struggled with. Um, Yeah, it wasn't something I was like out there about. I felt kind of, like I said earlier, betrayed by my own body, but also kind of judged by some people. I mean, I I think for the most part, people are pretty supportive, but I think sometimes people just make comments and say things that they don't even really realize what yeah. they're actually saying to you. Yeah. I, I wonder about that. Um, I mean, judged is one thing. I often think maybe people are straight up judged, so I don't mean to put words in anyone's mouth, but often we just anticipate being judged. And so we behave as if we've already been judged, but yeah. people don't think about what they're saying. Right. So I, you know, When I was pregnant with my fourth and people knew I had three girls, everyone was like, oh, you hoping for a boy this time? Like, no. You're like, no, I'm hoping for a healthy baby. And no offense, but I'm kind of hoping for another girl. I I got this girl thing down. Um, (laughs) And so, you know, uh, or I have lesbian friends who there's such a regular question of, um, oh, well, who's the, they'll ask, who's the real mom? Well, they're both real moms. Oh well, you God. know what I mean. Who carried yeah. the baby? Like, you're like, what? Does anybody ask you who carried your baby? Like, who does that? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, it occurred to me, and I had to stop myself. So I get that people are human and people let things come out of their mouth before they really think about what they're saying. So I encourage you all to think about what you're saying. But earlier I thought, oh, I wonder if she wants to have more children. And then I was like, I'm not going to ask that question. So I'm not asking it. You don't have to answer that question. But I did think about it. And then I was like, well, that could be a really hurtful question for somebody who struggled to conceive, right? It's not my damn business. I think... I think that's particularly hard for for somebody who has like one healthy child and you're like, I'm just happy I got the one. I worked really right. hard for him. <laughs> and people who don't know the background could so easily say, oh, are you hoping to have more? And that could be so harmful. Right. And I think the older your your child gets, the more people ask because they just want to know when you're going to pop the next one out as if it was just no big deal. <laughs> not their business. It's not your business, folks. How often somebody reproduces or doesn't or what their process is to creating a family. (laughs) Unless they offer the information, it's really best not to ask. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. So if you were to give one piece of advice to women out there struggling with infertility, what would it be? Oh, boy. I think that's a big question. I know. (laughs) I think that the biggest piece of advice I could give right now would be to do your best to take care of yourself and your mental health um, and take some time out for yourself every week or every day to do just that. And that might look different for different people, whether it's, you know, going and getting a massage or, or exercising or making sure you're eating a healthy diet, I think, or maybe doing some reading that, or practicing gratitude. Right, exactly. <laughs> practice- Not just a shameless plug, friends. It actually works. No, truly, the more you practice gratitude, the more it becomes real in your life. And you Absolutely. do become more grateful. And it, it gives you something positive to look forward to in, instead of being in a, a negative headspace all the time, which can be really easy to get into when you're struggling to conceive. Yeah, absolutely. How do you practice self-care? Well, I tend to be kind of a girly girl, so I like to go and get like my nails done or get a massage, um, you know, get my hair blown out, you know, that kind of like personal 
um, care stuff that you totally avoid and put off when you're a mom because you right. don't have the time or you just feel like you shouldn't spend the money. Absolutely. Um, I should like to exercise, but I don't. <laughs> well, I don't deal in shoulds and have tos because I, I call BS on all of that. Yeah. Although I often feel like I should be loving to exercise. I, you know, total sidebar here. The people who say they love it, it gives them so much energy. It makes them feel great. I don't understand those people. And I am envious of them. And I try not to use the word envious. In fact, I challenged myself this year to find other ways to say that so that I could invite the good into my life instead of the negative. But I do not understand it. I wish that I did. I wish that I loved the way it felt to exercise, but I hate it. (laughs) I know. I'm totally in the same boat with you. I'm never sorry that I did it once I actually do, but it's never like on my list of, oh, I can't wait to go (laughs) sweat a bunch. And (laughs) It, It only just makes me tired and hungry. I never have a lot of energy afterwards. I'm just tired and hungry and probably a little cranky. Right. Somebody out there is going to tell me that it's because I need to do it more often. Maybe, but I feel you. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent. So as you're going through this process, as you went through surgery that that went well, and then you started alternative medication, um, and then you were able to conceive, and now this wonderful project with the ability to touch the lives of all of these women. How do you stop and honor and celebrate these successes, whether they feel like huge leaps or small incremental successes? How do you celebrate them? Well, I actually was working with a personal coach for a little while, like a life coach. Yeah, Um, girl, life coaches. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like awesome. (laughs) And I, I, she started taking notes for for me of all the things like I would set goals and she would take notes on the goals I set. And then each week when I would talk to her, she would write down like the things that I accomplished. And it was funny because going through the process, I sort of was like, well, I was going to, you know, accomplish A, B, and C, but I only did A. And so it's easy to be like, I didn't really do anything. But then when she wrote everything down and read it all back to me, I was like, damn, I did a lot. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And you've got to celebrate that. Yeah. So I think that just writing it down and taking, you know, note of it and then going back and reviewing where you were before is huge for you to actually see. Yeah, I did do all these things. I love that because I don't know if you've grabbed your copy of my gratitude journal yet. Again, not really same shameless plug, but just the truth. <laughs> There's an element on every entry that says, what are your personal wins for the day? And oh, that, yeah. that is why it's in there, right? Is so that you can, to me, they're, they're very close to each other, but gratitude and celebration are different and they complement each other beautifully. So being grateful for something isn't necessarily the same as saying this thing went really well and I'm proud of it. Right. Um, I used to have um, an accountability partner. She was my wins accountability partner. And we would talk for five minutes once a week. And all we were allowed to do was say the things that had gone well. And so I talk about this when I'm speaking a lot. What you said was, I was going to do A, B, and C, but I only did A. So you feel bad before you start. And women love to do that to themselves. Mm -hmm. You (laughs) completely discredit yourself before you've done anything that that feels good and so we had a ground rule that we were not allowed to do that so instead of saying well i was going to do a b and c today but i only did a we would say i did a and then the other person would say oh my god that's awesome congratulations right Uh, Uh, and it changes everything it changes everything yeah it definitely helped a lot to focus and that's kind of something i've been working on a lot this this whole probably within the last six months is uh, my own personal mindset and being more positive and you know that just makes you more confident as well and so just to look back and say yeah I did all these things like in the moment I was thinking I didn't do enough or I didn't you know do everything I wanted but when I actually just looked back at all the positive things that I had accomplished it was like whoa hell yeah (laughs) yeah good for you I love that I'm a dance party girl I celebrate yeah. with a dance party. Oh yeah, but Me too. <laughs> I, I do keep track of my wins. I'm pro- I, I do a lot of screaming when things go well, and it's it. You know, the more you can celebrate, I think, the more the more you feel good about your accomplishments, and it just is kind of a motivation train moving forward. So I love yeah. that you do that. Don't stop doing it. Keep it up, yeah. even if you're not seeing your life coach anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not seeing her anymore, but uh, I learned a lot of great tools to uh, have in my you know in my 
tool belt so that I can continue moving forward. Good for you. So we're at the point in the show where I get to ask a question that I find really important and impactful as a community. And that is, what is your favorite charitable organization to support? Ooh, so I have a few. (laughs) Um, But for this project uh, in particular, the Kevin J. Letter Life Foundation is an, a nonprofit organization that helps couples who are having fertility issues who want to conceive do so when they're having financial struggles. Um, oh, that's which, awesome. Which we all know that depending on what state you live in, it's really expensive to go through fertility treatments. Yeah. It can be very, very difficult. Absolutely. So that's a wonderful organization. You guys, each week I ask you to learn more about them. There'll be links in the show notes. Go find out about this organization. If you have something to spare or share, please do so. But at the very least, maybe share their Facebook page or you know look up their Instagram feed and share it with somebody else that it may um, impact their lives. So thank you so much for that. Elena, can you share your three words with us one last time? Honest, real, and supportive. So these are great words. Um, The way that I perceive them, but I want to make sure it's what your intention was about it, is that um, these stories are just truthful. It's This is the real deal. These are everyday people, and you want to bring forth um, this safe space for them to to be themselves, to be honest, to be real, and to feel support for one another. Is that why you chose them? That is why I chose them. We just want to have this conversation and and decrease the stigma that's associated with fertility issues and and infertility treatments and so that more women can feel supported and like they're unafraid to talk about the struggles they've dealt with. Absolutely. Do you think you will do anything beyond the book once it's done? Oh gosh, I don't know. I'm just trying to take it one day, (laughs) one day at a time. You know, there are a couple events that I'm going to help sponsor and those are on the website to raise money for fertility stuff. But yeah, I'm not sure. It's, it's so funny. The project just started out like so, so little and it's just grown exponentially every day almost, I feel like. And so we'll see. I don't know where it'll lead me, but I'm totally open to what the universe throws my way. (laughs) I love that. I'm all about being open to the universe. I could see some things. I could see you doing more of a virtual thing where people have an opportunity to come in and tell their stories. So keep us posted on, on what you do. And once the book is out, make sure that we have links. We'll put it out on all of our social media platforms and make sure people have access to getting their own copy of it. Elena, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Heather. I really appreciate it. I loved hearing what you're up to, and I'm excited to support you on it. So thanks for being here. Thanks. All right, listeners, each week on this show, we introduce you to someone with a new and brave story. It's my hope that you find connection in these stories. Perhaps you hear something that resonates with you, inspires you, motivates you. Maybe you feel a little bit less alone. Part of my commitment to you is to always bring powerful and impactful stories of everyday people just like you and me. Together, we can learn from one another and grow in truly beautiful ways. I am incredibly grateful to have you here with me. This is Heather Vickery reminding you today and always to choose bravely. The Brave Files is proudly supported by Audible. If you enjoy listening to podcasts, you're sure to love listening to your favorite books on Audible. Get your free 30-day trial complete with a credit for a free audiobook download today simply by visiting audibletrial.com slash the brave files. Again, that's visiting audibletrial.com slash the brave files. The Brave Files is proudly supported by Lost Format Apparel, a socially conscious clothing company. You already know that homelessness is a huge problem. Over half a million Americans are living without shelter and millions more without consistent access to everyday basics. My friends at Lost Format know that solving homelessness is a much larger problem than any one company or person can solve on their own. It requires teamwork, sacrifice, strength, and building communities through personal and professional relationships. And isn't that exactly what the Brave Files podcast is all about? 
That's why I'm proud to say that The Brave Files has partnered with Lost Format. And together, we're working to change the face of consumerism in addressing homelessness. You can now get one of two fantastic shirts custom designed specifically for The Brave Files. Each order goes towards providing necessities to the homeless. We have one shirt that, of course, says choose bravely, and another that reminds you that brave is always greater than fearless. Head on over to vickeryandco.com slash store to see both beautiful shirts and to check out the entire product line from Lost Format. All of their stuff is super soft and comfortable and has an amazing fit. Use promo code BRAVE to get 10% off of your Brave Files custom t-shirts. And if you have an order over $30, your shipping is free. I choose bravely to take the plunge to help solve homelessness. Are you with me? Thank you for listening to The Brave Files. Be sure to visit thebravefilespodcast.com to access the show notes and discover fantastic bonus content. Music composed and produced by Matt Lewis of Union Music, LLC. Special thanks to our editor and audio mix expert, Andrew Olson. I am eternally grateful for all that he does to make each week sound so fantastic. You can hear more of Andrew's work at findandrewolson.com.